Happy Halloween! I'm pumpkin garnet with pumpkin eggs! This review is a very different one from my usual content. We're looking at a live action movie today, and unlike my usual reviews, this one will not be spoiler free. Wait, no, don't leave yet. I'm not spoiling it yet. I'll tell you when that starts. I'm going to switch around the order that I do things in this review, so I can tell you if I recommend it or not before I spoil it. When I was a five-year-old in 2001, there was a Halloween movie that I watched over and over and over, you know, the way that five-year-olds do. But for the longest time, I couldn't remember what that movie was. I still can't remember if every time I watched it was on TV or if we owned it on VHS or DVD, but got rid of it for some reason. I couldn't find a physical copy of it in any of my or my mom's stuff. I can't remember if there were any years immediately after 2001 where I also watched it, because if we got rid of it, Maybe it was because it scared my little brother. My brother's fear endangered a lot of things in our house. We got rid of our Alice Cooper record, the w one of the ones where his face was green. I didn't let my mom get rid of the Dark Crystal, but he was older when we got that. Up until last Halloween, before I started my YouTube channel, all I could remember was a dried up skeleton dude with black hair and glowing green eyes slowly walking down a staircase. That's all. Going off just that memory and nothing else, I somehow managed to find the movie. Perfect timing, because it was when we were trying to figure out what to watch for Halloween, like as a family. You already know, because I put it in the title and the thumbnail, that movie was When Good Ghouls Go Bad. And I am so thankful to have found it. My memory doesn't last too long, so I wish I could have made a note on if my brother said he remembered anything from the movie or not, but I didn't know I would be making this video in the future, so there goes that clue. When Good Ghouls Go Bad is a family-friendly comedy Halloween movie from 2001 based off a book by R.L. Stein. I never read the book, but the cover is exactly like the movie's cover, except for Uncle Fred's face. This looks really weird. Directed by Patrick Reed Johnson, produced by Stephen R. McLaughlin, and aired on Fox Family on October 21st, 2001. Buying a physical copy is pretty expensive, so we watched it on YouTube. I'll link you to the full movie on YouTube, but I should warn you that there were some issues like the audio and video not being synced up right later on in the movie. That starts at around 1 hour and 10 or 11 minutes-ish. It was pretty distracting. I know two different videos and both have this problem in the exact same spot. None of the streaming services we had had it. I'm still wondering why this movie ended up becoming so obscure. I asked some friends my age if they remembered it and they didn't. While looking into the movie more, I found out that the boy who played Danny, Joe Pitchler, went missing in 2006 at age 18 and his case is still open. It's been about 16 years and no one knows if he's alive or not. It's both scary and depressing. Whatever happened, I hope there is and was no suffering. Let's get back to talking about this very fun and happy movie. Sorry about this upsetting moment, but it felt important. Alright, so before I go on and tell you what happens in the movie, do I recommend it? Yes, absolutely. It is such a good movie. This is my favorite Halloween movie now that I remember it. Before, I would have told you that my favorite was Hocus Pocus. I don't watch actual horror movies, or at least not modern ones because it hurts my chest bad when I get jump scared and I don't care for that. It's like getting punched all of a sudden when I was minding my own business. I do like old black and white horror movies though. Bela Lugosi movies, good stuff. Getting distracted. But like Halloween movies, fun, like fun family friendly type ones, I enjoyed those a lot. When Good Ghouls Go Bad is a very goofy kind of movie, hammy acting in a very good way. The characters are weird and don't behave like normal real life people. These characters were created by R.L. Stein, so yeah. Don't take it too seriously and have fun. The story, especially with that plot twist, is actually pretty good. I want to watch this every year. Absolutely watch it. It's family friendly, or at least it's supposed to be. The killing part? is actually pretty messed up. Some things might be a bit frightening to small children. The clown, some of the zombies. Five-year-old me loved it. 
If you let a small child watch any movie that might be scary to them, make sure you watch it with them so they feel safer. But yeah, I would absolutely show this to a child. If you don't get to survive being scared as a kid, how are you ever going to survive being scared as an adult? There's so much more to be scared of. Okay, so spoilers are going to start here. You can go and watch the movie if you don't want to get spoiled, or you can just keep on watching. Because I'm just going to tell you the whole story right now, from start to finish. That is what, what that's what's going on here. Danny Walker has just moved to Walker Falls, Minnesota, the place where his dad, James Walker, grew up. He lives with his dad, who is divorced from his mother, and his grandfather, Uncle Fred. Everybody calls him Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred is weird in a fun way, which I probably didn't need to tell you since he's played by Christopher Lloyd. The first time you see him, he's wearing a spacesuit while sleeping. The people in Walker Falls are weird as all heck, or at least they are at this time of the year. It's Halloween time, and the Walker family goes big on decorations, but their decorations get torn down. Awkward but funny scene in the beginning of a police officer just flailing around outside to get rid of the decorations. Nobody likes Danny at school. Not even the adults. The principal, th that old lady there, I think that was the principal, she hates him. But especially Ryan Kankle. Ryan Kankle is a football player and the school's worst bully. His dad, Mike Kankle, is the coach. And I don't remember his mother's name, but she is the cheerleading coach or whatever. Look at these haircuts. James Walker runs Walker Chocolates, a chocolate company started by Uncle Fred. He's busy working all the time and doesn't pay much attention to his family, something that Uncle Fred was once guilty of himself. He seems bitter about Uncle Fred doing that to him, even though he's doing the same to Danny. Anyway, he's trying to make some sort of deal with the Germans. More specifically, Schmidt Confections. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And his secretary, or whatever she is, Miss Vanderspool, seems to have a crush on the chairman and CEO, Werner Schmidt, as she is drawing red hearts and kisses all over a picture of him. Very productive. Danny's bullies block his way home after school by walking out in front of him from the graveyard. It's Ryan and a kid that was just called Dork. <laughs> I don't know if he has a name. At first, I couldn't figure out if the boy was also a cankle or not. He doesn't have the haircut, which seems to be very important for a cankle to have. But he was with the whole family all the time, like in the car, in the house. Then I realized I think he's actually this guy's kid. I don't know why he is like always with the cankles. <laughs> Anyway, they force Danny into the graveyard and kind of tell him why no one likes him. He's different, and that scares people. How is this very normal looking boy different? Well, he's not told how here, but we already know that it has to do with the Halloween decorations, because that thing with the police officer was weird. He also tells him about Curtis Danko, another boy who was different. Curtis was a very goth looking boy who didn't care about things like sports or whatever else other kids like to do. He instead loved art and enjoyed creating very dark and strange works of art. Well, the city council was holding a competition where the students would all create a sculpture of their hero and the best one would be displayed in the town square as a statue. Curtis was the only student who wouldn't work on his sculpture during the day in front of the others. He kept it covered and worked on it secretly at night, which by the way, very awkward just sitting there not doing anything during the entirety of art class, just staring at everyone. Take note of the very loud fireflies in the room while he works at night here. They are important. Halloween 1981 was Curtis's last day alive. Mike Hankel found his burned skeleton in the kiln the next day with a message written in the ashes. If you ever have another Halloween, I will return and destroy you all. Mike was the only one who saw Curtis's statue and covered it back up quickly as his eyes burned and he was blind for three days. The town has kept the sculpture hidden away in Curtis's crypt, no one ever daring to uncover it in fear that they will die just from the sight of it. The town never had another Halloween. Danny thinks this is really dumb. <laughs> However, he's still too scared to go into the crypt and look at it when Ryan tries to make him. Ryan wanted to test the sculpture on someone else so that he could maybe look at it if it's safe to. But yeah, no, Danny runs away like his life depends on it. Dork chases after, but Uncle Fred scares him at the door while dressed as a viking. As you do. 
By the way, Danny can just phase through gates and Dork can dig holes really, really fast. Uncle Fred is the movie's narrator. He explains that he is the one who insisted that absolutely everyone should call him Uncle Fred. To keep the human symbol of the Walker Chocolate Company front and center at all times, which was fine with Danny because there was no way he could ever call a guy who could play Nintendo, skateboard, and drive a go-kart like me, Grandpa. Meanwhile, Ryan found the sculpture and plans to get rich by having people pay to not see what's under it. Can't, can't they just turn around and run away from it for free or want to reach, retine them up and forcing their eyes open? What's the plan here? I don't understand, but Dork here thinks it's genius. James is planning a spooktacular for the Germans and he is absolutely thrilled about it, obsessed with it. He wants to start up the old factory that Uncle Fred shut down after the Curtis Danko incident. He reveals his plan at the town meeting. Everyone flips out at the very mention of Halloween, and they all run screaming out of the room when a projector starts showing spooky scenes on a screen. So yeah, that didn't go well. He almost got through to them through chocolates, though. They were intrigued on reopening the factory, just they just didn't want the Halloween. Also, before that meeting, James got reacquainted with Taylor Morgan, the school nurse, a girl he used to go out with. She is also divorced now. How convenient. Uncle Fred is pretty bummed out. He was the one who built and donated the kiln that Curtis Danko died in. He wants to leave town to go to Cape Kennedy. James used to want to go there to see the Apollo moon rocket go off, and Uncle Fred promised him they would go, but never did. So he's going now by himself. Danny can't go because of school, and oddly enough, Danny is the one that points this out. Like if if one of my grandparents was, hey, you want to skip school and go do literally anything else besides school, I'd be like, yeah. When Uncle Fred is trying to leave, there's a large crowd of people outside their house. Loads of Halloween decorations appeared in the town overnight. The Walker family gets the blame for it, though Danny and Uncle Fred don't seem to know anything about it. In the town square is an enormous pile of pumpkins. Big, beautiful, <laughs> possible pile of pumpkins. Absolutely enormous. I've also had this image in my brain since childhood, but I wasn't sure if it was connected to the skeleton boy memory until I rediscovered this. It's the kind of memory that you think you might have just made up yourself. The townspeople are at first scared. But then start warming up at the idea of getting a pumpkin and eating pie. And it seems like they're starting to like the idea of Halloween again. Then there's a rumbling. The pumpkin pile falls down on top of Uncle Fred, killing him. Another image that has been in my brain. One pumpkin is completely on his head, like Jack from Animal Crossing or any pumpkin headed character, I guess. I find every single one of those pumpkins to be a satisfying shape and size. By the way, I just thought I'd tell you that. Uncle Fred keeps narrating during his funeral, giving away that his role in the movie is not over yet. A cheerleader from school, Dana, tries to comfort Danny by talking about the gross stuff happening to dead loved ones' bodies underground. Yet yeah, Danny thinks that's weird too. Dana takes Danny to Curtis Danko's house. It's abandoned, so it makes me wonder about his parents, who are never mentioned. Dana and the other kids in town have been decorating the house and saving up their candy so they can have a party and go trick-or-treating in there. That's actually really cute. But, like, I get choosing an abandoned house so you don't get caught by grown-ups, but having Halloween in the house of someone who banned Halloween seems like a good way to get haunted. Ryan Kankle shows up and threatens both of their parents. Since Mike Kankle is the football coach, assistant principal and is running for mayor. 
he could get Dana's mom fired and keep James from getting the permit for the factory. Dana's mom is that nurse, by the way. Danny makes a deal to let Ryan use the top floor of the house, which of course he's going to put the, the statue up there. Dana is not happy about all this and calls Danny a coward. Fireflies. Danny returns home and, well, Uncle Fred is back. He doesn't seem worried about his condition. He says he got enough air through his skin to survive and that someone, he doesn't know who, pulled him out of his grave. Danny thinks that makes sense. Sorta. Ish. Uncle Fred walks outside and scares the ever-loving heck out of the Kankles who were having all of the Halloween decorations torn down. His hand gets cut off in the car window. So yeah, no, definitely not alive. Danny has to convince him that he is indeed a zombie. And now his hand is lost. Mike Kinkle goes from thinking Uncle Fred is a zombie to being convinced that it's all a hoax and the death was fake. During this scene, we see that the haircut is hereditary. Danny tries to tell Dana about his zombie uncle. She does not believe him. The Kinkles are having an Oktoberfest at their home, so Uncle Fred dresses up as Cheesy the Clown so he can go look for his hand. It's very weird. Danny and Dana are both at this event along with Taylor and James. Danny is the only one who recognizes Uncle Fred. Somehow. Uncle Fred ends up with his body being pulled and sliced all apart. It is weird. But at least they get all the pieces because the hand eventually comes back by itself with fireflies. It was weird. The parents don't notice any of this and think that the kids are just helping the band pack up as they carry away all of the body parts. It was weird. Dana believes Danny now. Romance. More Halloween decorations have popped up even though no one in the Walker family knows anything about it. And then, zombies. Zombies suddenly show up and chase Danny, Dana, and Uncle Fred back home. The zombies have been putting up the decorations all along. Also, there's this kind of dumb thing where Danny says that Uncle Fred's grave didn't have a hole, so he had to have been busted out from under the ground. Like what, he would still have to have come out of a hole? Like, if the zombies busted him out, they all still had to have exited the ground from somewhere to get him out. Like what? Miss Vanderspool is driving the Germans from the airport and into town. She drives like a maniac and they also encounter the zombies. Don't expect too much spectacular stuff just yet. <laughs> Okay. Back home, they reassemble Uncle Fred. Not correctly the first time, but they manage it. It was gross. Uncle Fred's hand has the key to Curtis Danko's crypt. Uncle Fred? Yeah. That's the key to Curtis Danko's crypt. What did you do? What did you do? The police dude, Ed, tells Mike that someone broke into the crypt. The sculpture is gone. And so is Curtis Danko's body, but there was only one set of footprints leading away from the body. They are freaked out. We both know how Curtis Danko really got into that kill. Now don't we, Ed? There was a brief but creepy scene where we see Ed discovering this like earlier. And looky, looky, you can see him. You can see him leaving right there. Danny is losing his mind. I love how he's looking up while he yells. But then Uncle Fred tells him about the fireflies. A weird kid used to smash them and spread the glow stuff on his face. It still glowed while the fireflies were dead. Why did it still glow? Magic. When fireflies die, their magic is released into the ground and stores up in there. That's why he and the other zombies are alive. Firefly magic and wishes. Alive people wish on stars, dead people wish on dead fireflies. That's my takeaway. But that magic eventually fades away. Mike is trying to become mayor right now instead of waiting for the election in November. Almost everyone is gathered in town hall. I like this dude here. Well, someone or something put up all those Halloween decorations, and if it's the living dead, I'm gonna have to vote for being afraid. The zombies bust in and capture everyone. James and Taylor show up and see Uncle Fred. 
they pass out. The zombies show up and everyone gets captured except for the kids who jumped out the window. The zombies are chanting, They want the statue. We go back to the people in town hall getting captured and, What are you doing? I just want to leave something for my family so they know what my last moments were like. <laughs> Danny and Dana flee to Curtis Danko's house. Danny freaks out when he sees that his grandma is also a zombie. Why is this what scares you now? Creepy ape mask kid. All of the kids are in the house and the zombies show up there as well. Ryan doesn't believe that they're real until he rips the face off of one with his own bare hand. Jeez, this <laughs> probably one of the actually freakiest moments with all the shaking and screaming that the zombie is doing and the bloody little details. Maybe this scene is the reason we no longer owned a physical copy. That would have definitely scared my brother. The fireflies fly into the ape mask's eyes. He removes the mask, revealing himself to be Curtis Danko. Curtis is not played by an actor in costume like the other zombies. He is a puppet, and because of this, is able to look more skeletal and uncanny. This is why his image stuck so strongly to my brain. The kids run and end up sinking into a rug and falling through a hole that just broke in the floor. What? I love how even though his face doesn't move, it seems like even Curtis himself is also weirded out by this happening as he just watches them sink. They land safely on the floor below where the rest of the townsfolk have been taken by the zombies. Everyone is here now. Well... Almost everyone. The zombies set up the statue in the middle of the room. The shroud for the statue has dark markings that look like a scary eyes and mouth. Like, why would that show on the shroud? And now, it's time for that scene. The one I remembered. Curtis Danko, with his thin, puppety skeleton body, slowly walks down the staircase and past Uncle Fred, and stands in front of the statue, his bones clanking and creaking the whole way. It feels like it takes a longer time than it actually does to me. I love this moment so much. I want this puppet. I really do, I want this. Danny and Dana both try to get Curtis to blame them for bringing back Halloween and spare the others. He doesn't speak, but he's not buying it as he turns away back towards his statue. The spooky moment is suddenly interrupted by Mike Kankel bursting in wearing a football uniform. He throws a football, knocking Curtis's head off, and then proceeds to stomp him to bits. He celebrates killing the zombie. It's weird. It's really weird. Curtis pulls himself back together. You suck, Mike. Curtis finally pulls the shroud off of the statue. Everyone screams in terror until they realize what they're actually looking at. Instead of some horrible devil or whatever they thought it would be, it's a beautiful sculpture of Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred was Curtis Danko's hero. Uncle Fred doesn't understand how that could be since he still blames himself for building that kiln. Curtis points at Mike. Mike and his fellow bullies chased Curtis into that kiln. He was hiding from them so they couldn't hurt him, and he got locked in. The janitor came by with headphones on, listening to loud music, and accidentally turned on the kiln, bumping it with the stick end of a mop. Mike is the one who wrote that message in the ashes and faked being blind to keep anyone from finding out what he had done, and to keep anyone from seeing the sculpture of Uncle Fred, a man he hated for putting his money towards art and sissy stuff instead of sports and building a football theme park. Mike's sculpture was of his own father. He wanted that one to be displayed instead. James stands up against Mike, telling him what a great man his father, Uncle Fred, is. Then Mike's zombie dad shows up and drags him away by the ear. I love it. A, z a zombie with that hair. Look at him. Look at him. Curtis claps, and everyone joins in. Even Mike's family claps. And does this little skeleton dude not look absolutely adorable to you now? Curtis leaves, looking back at everyone first. Everyone still looks a little bit scared of him, but I think if he had the muscles for it, Curtis would have been smiling. 
That's a happy look, I can tell. This glance back when he's leaving is very much also stuck in my head. <laughs> Uncle Fred reunites with his wife, Doris. He tells Danny and James that he feels good, and he tells James that he finally knows that he's loved by him. Uncle Fred and Doris join the other zombies in one last dance with the fireflies. Curtis looks back at the dance from afar, and they dance until they all fade into dust. And I am impressed with myself for not crying while <laughs> saying that, because I cannot watch the part without crying. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is, it is so beautiful. Now it's daytime, all of a sudden. The Germans are here. They thought the zombies were a planned thing. They loved it. They're, they're doubling their investment. They want another spectacular next year. I don't know, because they, they, they want an even better one. But it's like, how are you, how are you going to top actual zombies? How, how are you going to do that? <laughs> are we going to resurrect the dead again next year? Just to make sure it's just as good. We're going to find some, I don't know, some, <laughs> some ghosts, some, some vampires or something. We got to top it. We got to add some more real monsters in here. When asked what time they should meet, James answers two weeks from now. He wants to take Danny to Cape Kennedy first. What will Werner Schmidt do for two whole weeks while waiting? Miss Vanderswool, apparently. By the way, during the dance, Danny and Dana kissed, and their parents are also a thing now, so that's kind of weird. The movie ends with children in costume happily running and laughing in front of Uncle Fred's statue, which is now displayed in the town square. Happy Halloween! Halloween. Thank you so much if you've watched this long of me just telling you about a movie that I already told you to watch beforehand. So you probably already actually knew everything that I told you. I hope you do watch it if you haven't already. I love this movie to the point where it might be ridiculous. I'm serious about wanting that puppet. I mean it. I, I want that puppet. Curtis Danko and Uncle Fred are my favorite characters. Tell me who yours are if you've already watched this. Or if you haven't, but you already know who your favorites would be. All the actors did such a good job. I feel like there was a lot of love put into this movie. I should probably read the book. I, I would really actually like to buy the movie on DVD. They need to re-release it for hopefully a cheaper price than what I can find it for now. I wonder if they can't for some reason. And like, that's my only option is to spend like, what prices do I even see? Like 50, 60, probably more for some of them, depending on where you find them for it on DVD. I think it might be, was it cheaper on VHS? But I don't have a VHS, oh, wait, do I? No, I don't, I don't think I have a VHS player anywhere right now. Hey, I could check. Anyway, that's it for this video. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. You can check out my Twitter and Patreon in the description if you want. Most of my videos are completely different. Well, not completely different because I do reviews, but like most of my videos are like anime or gaming or doll related. So, but you know, my channel is for whatever, whatever I feel like making videos about. So if you're interested in any of that, then you should absolutely subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Happy Halloween!